From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet, ladies and gentlemen, Starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. We're here every Friday. And we are going to today deal with your questions on our famous question and answer format, Starting Strength Radio podcast. This is where you ask us interesting questions. And if we find them equally interesting, we will respond to those. Now, understand that most of the questions that we that we get submitted here on our speak up channel that is uh, access through the through uh, my q a on the board we don't find interesting most of the time they're obnoxious or stupid or repetitive or what else inappropriate mainly just stupid mainly they're just <laughs> stupid so we don't deal with it but every once in a while as you'll see we, we have uh, some good questions, and we've got enough of those to talk about today to accumulate a Q&A show. So we're going to do it. But first, as usual, comments, comments from, from the, the haters. haters. All right. Thwack Indna says, okay, enough with the merch. Leather shoes, leather belts, rips, got a thing for animal skin, and Gianna Michaels. We got it. (laughs) All right. This one is from a person by the name of The Goal of My Pool is Your Hole. Those belts must be strong to hold the guts of all... You SS fatties. Hey, Rip, why don't you release the SS bro for your gyno tigo biddies and charge $499 for them? I know you like big, hairy man boobs with thick, bumpy nips. Jesus, you and Blaha are the most delusional fat boys on YT. I, I don't understand it myself. But once again, we're dealing with the bottom 3% of humanity on uh, YouTube comments. Uh, all right. So, Foriel 9000 says, please create a different channel for your advertisements. Thanks. <laughs> well, Why would I do that? I mean, we want you to watch our advertisements. You know. Pollux asks, Why are Ripito's nipitos hard? Is he some kind of perverto? Pervito. Pervito. (laughs) I don't know why these people are so fascinated with my fucking nipples. I... I mean, you can't even see them. I, I, I mean, here's a better question. Have you ever seen a boy with soft nipples? I haven't. But then again, I don't look at boys' nipples. So I may be wrong. And Chap, of course, says, Wait, at so 2353, the expression on Mark's face just epically invites a young stud to... <clears throat> I'm probably not going to read this one. Yeah, okay. This one is far too bizarre for even comments, comments from, from the, the haters. haters. So you're saying a boy's nipples should always be hard? Well, I mean, boys' nipples have a characteristic shape, and 
Because they, well, look, <laughs> once again, I, I just, I once again, I'm only familiar, I'm intimately familiar with mine, and I've just noticed that they're all the they're same way all the damn time. You know, I think you'll think about it. Yours probably are too. Right? Well, yeah. Uh, right? Rusty? I, right? I have no dog in this fight. <laughs> but you have an opinion. Whether it's a valuable one or not remains to be seen. I mean, I guess my nipples change with the they temperature. Don't, they don't change with the temperature. If I'm excited. I was out <laughs> yesterday unloading that load of wood out of my trailer. Rock hard nipples. Rock hard nipples. <laughs> Sweat pouring off of my ass. Just as fast as it could pour, rock hard little bitty pencil eraser looking nipples. <laughs> uh, oh goddamn shit! Yeah, I know. I know. It's I, it's it's odd that it comes up. It's very odd. So let's go ahead and do our podcast, shall we? And let's talk about the questions that have come in over the past couple of. Uh, Months. I think these some of these actually date back. I found soft man nipples. Huh? <laughs> you did on the internet? Yeah. Oh God! There's probably a whole website <laughs> devoted. <laughs> she's got <laughs> she's got forty pictures here of soft man nipples. It would never have occurred to me to Google that. <laughs> it would, would never have occurred to my ass. Oh God. <laughs> Now, anyway, all right, on, all right, we're moving. Now, moving along, realfastenglish.com writes, have you given any thought to interviewing Dr. Rhonda Patrick about nutrition? All right, I, and the only reason I read this is because uh, you guys don't understand that I don't get to interview whoever I want to on our little goofy podcast here because nobody knows who we are except you all right dr rhonda patrick has you know is a is a big name and she's not going to come on here and talk to me hell she can talk to rogan hold it wait ah there he is again i, I wish he'd just, just do that reply with text thing it says sorry reply can't right sorry now. can't talk right now okay that's the easy way. He'll interrupt us another two or three times during this podcast. It's about every afternoon this time he calls, wanting me to be on his show. And, uh, you know, look, I've already told him no four or five times. It's offered to fly me out, you know, buy the beer, get the room, girls, DMT, DMT, DMT yeah. everything else. But no, I just you know I don't have uh, don't have time for it. So uh, there, there it is again. All right, now uh, you know I have thought about asking uh, Barack Obama to come on the show. Thought about interviewing him about his training program. Uh, thought about uh, asking uh, Angela Merkel. German Chancellor to come on, talk about her her thoughts on fitness, international politics. You know, could Arnold? We we could talk to Arnold. We thought about having him on the show. Uh, Who else would be good to have on the show? Uh, Jana Michaels. Jana Michaels. (laughs) Well, we could talk to her. We could talk to Jana Michaels. Uh, I bet Rusty she's got a lot to say. R- Rusty, call her. All right, I'll, I'll okay, hit her, up. hit her up. See if she'll come I'll in. Slide in her DMs. <laughs> you know, uh, who else? Who's that economist that writes for the New York Times? The guy that you know never makes any fucking sense. <laughs> said, this, no, said the economy was never going to recover from Donald Trump being elected president. I can't remember his name. We could have him on the show. Have him on the show. How about Bill Clinton? You want to have Bill Clinton on the show? Yeah. He'd be interesting to talk to. Talk about his vegan diet. How veganism has been kind to him. Could do that. 
All right, well, we'll give that all some thought. I'm <laughs> not getting in trouble. <laughs> Why all these people that he knows seems to be committing suicide all the time? Isn't it amazing that none of us has people just falling dead around us all day? Be a good skill to have. Uh, I can think of several people that I'd like to just have suicided, but I don't have that power. Well, anyway. So, yeah, we've given a lot of thought to having all these people on the show, but unfortunately, it's not up to us. Okay, Dan asks, Rip, do you do chin-ups? Well, that's an interesting question. I have recently started back doing some chin-ups. Uh, I did them for years and years and years, and I just got tired of the damn thing, so I started doing barbell rows. And uh, I am... Uh, Starting back to try to incorporate some chin-ups into my into my program. I've got uh, some stuff that's badly wrong with my right shoulder. I was doing dips. Oh, several months ago, I was doing some dips. I'd done it was my third dip workout. First time I'd done them in a long time. I did you know a couple sets of just long, extensive warm up. A couple of sets of ten reps at body weight. They didn't feel bad, not not bad at all. Second workout, I did three sets of 10 body weight dips. And then the third workout, I was on my second set of 10 after a long, extensive warm-up, and I felt three distinct pops on the posterior side of my right shoulder. And if you'll examine it now, you'll find that the muscle belly where the infraspinatus should be is gone so i'm pretty sure that i ruptured the infraspinatus and the teres minor i think those are both gone and uh, they were solid rupture sounds i know what it sounds like and uh you know the thing is stabilized i'm back to doing benches and presses never have bothered it uh but i thought three or four weeks ago i'd start back doing some chins and I've been I've been going out like once every two weeks and uh, doing ten sets separated by jogging a lap on the track in the back. So I was just you know trying something different again. So yeah, I've been doing some chins, and uh, I don't ever do pull ups because I think they're stupid. Why would I want to do that movement and consciously omit the bicep from the movement? I don't see the point. Why pull up when you can chin up? Uh, so, yeah, I'm doing some chins. Uh, don't appear to have lost a lot of strength, but I'm I'm trying to go very slowly because I don't want another disaster to befall my right shoulder by introducing an old movement back into the program too quickly. Bill Gellner writes, weightlifting off and on since age 10. My dad, PE degree, got on the barbell bandwagon while still in his teens. I've been fairly conscientious about the program, somewhat lax on the diet, all three books heavily highlighted. 70 years old, April 2017. After, after but not during a heavy set of squats, my S1 sciatica flared up. Present over 10 years, usually more numbness than pain. Restarted novice progression last summer. Same event in January 2019. After, not during squats. Have continued with chin-ups, pull-ups, benches, overhead presses. Nothing for what my father called the hip girdle. I see my options as one. Cautiously restart novice progression to squat and deadlift. Two, any combination of treadmill with elevation three farmers walk with dumbbells four stair stepper for high intensity interval training hip thrust planks glued hand machine box squats with dumbbells uh bill um you don't mention having done deadlifts in the first part of this comment and i'm wondering if you were deadlifting during the uh the the first instances where you hurt your low back um 
it's been my experience with sciatica. Uh, there is a there's a good way to address it with a massage. And if you can get somebody to do this for you, it's worth a try. Usually the sciatica, sciatic symptoms flare up because the piriformis muscle is impinging the nerve as it comes out of the hip. And what I, I, can, I can fix a sciatica on somebody else. I can't do it on me, obviously, but I can fix a sciatica uh, with uh, a massage with my elbow right in the cheek of the ass that gets down into the, into the belly of the piriformis and stretches it out. Uh, it's extremely painful. I recommend bourbon prior to this, mm-hmm. but uh, that pretty much always fixes it. I can I can take care of a, a a sciatica flare up with that on pretty much everybody I try to do it with. Uh, but I'm wondering if you were deadlifting while you were squatting, find somebody to address this situation with a with a piriformis release, and see if that doesn't help and uh, post it on the board, let us know. Okay. Now, Carhartt wants to know, I'd like to know your thoughts on recycling as in sorting recyclable materials, such as cans, plastic, paper. Do the start to drink gyms f- follow any kind of recycling program asking for a friend? Why do always people always say asking for a friend when they're not really asking for a friend? I think that's the joke. It's the joke. I think like, if if they say nipples, which works better, like my nipples are soft, are soft. how do mean? I make them hard? Asking for a friend, yeah. which works better, Levitra, Cialis, Viagra. Not that I have, you know, just asking for a friend. I, yeah. you know, have never needed any such yeah. recreational medication like that. <laughs> so this asking for a friend shit's pretty interesting. So this guy wants to know about recycling. All right, here's what I think about recycling. I think recycling is stupid. I think that if there is a market for the thing being recycled, then there is a price attached to the recycling. For example, there is a market for aluminum. When you recycle aluminum cans, you are participating in the market for a commodity. All right, there is no market for recycling newspapers or plastic. That's why you don't get money back for recycled newspapers or plastic. Anything for which there is a market in the, in the, for recycling that commodity, there will be a price attached that they will pay you for that commodity. And this is just simple economics. If you are recycling newspaper and plastic, what is probably taking place is you're handling handing that to the recycling people and they are throwing it away because of you know mandates at the government level for these things to be recycled not because there's actually a market for it they're not valuable when you hear the word valuable recycling value means something words have meanings value is money you recycle aluminum cans because there's a market for it there's no market for recycling glass because sand is very very cheap already and it's you know there's so much glass that's contaminated with dye and and for example i don't think there's a market for green recycled glass like wine bottles i think there may be a you know they can recycle clear glass but uh, there are some types of glass, and I don't know the particulars on that, that are not recyclable. And, and it's really, there's no market for it. There's no market for it. Put it in the landfill. It's, a, it's inert. It's not going to hurt anything in the landfill. But if they don't pay you for it, then there's no market for it. And if there's no market for it, why recycle it? Right? That's just the economics of the situation. You know, we send our recyclable shit to China. We send what? Our recyclable shit to China. We do. 
We send recyclable shit to China. Well, that's certainly cheap enough to do, isn't it? It gets trucked somewhere and then shipped to China. I don't know what they're doing in China. That sounds like, uh, that almost sounds like it might be, uh, might have a carbon footprint. A little bit, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. But the real problem with it is the racism. Of course. Of course. That's the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue with everything is the racism. Right? I mean, it's America, you know, the only country on earth that still practices Philadelphia racism. Philadelphia is now burning about half of its 1.5 million residents' recycling materials in an incinerator. Because that's better than putting it in a because landfill. Because that's better than recycling it, right? No, that's stuff, better than putting it in a landfill. Yeah, the stuff that's getting recycled is being, half of it's being burned. Is going up into the air. Into the air. Yeah. So what does that tell you about recycling? If they're not willing to pay you for the recycling, don't give it to them because they're going to throw it away or burn it or send it to China or South Africa or some other implausible place where people of different races exist because that's racist. All right. Now, German Hincapi says that may be racism, too. I mean, the Germans are a race, right? Hello, Mark. I would like to know what is your approach to mental training for performance purposes? Do you have any advice on how to train your mind in order to focus, visualize, and perform more efficiently? Well, it's been a while since I've talked about this. Let me point you to uh, the best book that's ever been written on sports psychology. All you need to read is the first two chapters. It's called The Inner Game of Tennis. The Inner Game of Tennis. Get it on Amazon. Read the first two chapters. Those are my thoughts on how to visualize and perform more efficiently. It works every single time it's tried. It's the most brilliantly distilled thing, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because I want you to buy the man's book. And... Uh, Books written by, here, look it up for me, Bree. W. Timothy Galway. Yeah, Timothy w, Timothy Galway. The book is written by Timothy Galway, and uh, it was written probably 30 or 40 years ago. It's a classic text. It's probably in several different editions. I know he's written a version for golf, but the what, this is like training. It doesn't matter what sport it's applied to. His method works beautifully. Buy the book, read it, and see what you think. Jack asks, the standing vertical jump, which you often refer to as a measure of an athlete's inherent physical ability. There's a period there. He's, Jack's not a writer. Much like the IQ of a person, this value cannot be significantly increased but it's basically the inherent makeup of that individual. However, a male being tested at the age of 18 is going to have a significantly higher standing vertical jump than he will at 68. Even a superior athlete with a vertical jump of 30 plus inches at the age of 18 is going to have a horrible vertical jump value at the age of 68, yet he is the same person. So my questions are, at what age range are standing vertical jump numbers valid? And the age range is college age people, early 20s. That's where all the data is collected because as you get older, the data becomes less valuable because standing vertical jump, explosive ability erodes with age. And we know this. So that's the first question. Are there any curves showing the degradation of the standing vertical jump with age? Well, probably not because we don't test older people on the standing vertical jump. The standing vertical jump and all explosive activity becomes kind of dangerous for people doing it over the age of 50. Connective tissue composition changes, uh, fast twitch uh, motor units kind of erode in terms of their ability and uh, potential for an injury becomes more significant as you get older. Uh, what tests can be used to determine the inherent athletic ability of a 68-year-old? 
Does the reaction time of an individual mean anything to inherent strength ability? He asks, what test can be used to determine the inherent athletic ability of a 68-year-old? <laughs> Jack, why do you care? It's lower <laughs> when you're 68 than it would be when you're younger. You're not an athlete at the age of 68, not at least in any any sense that makes it relative to anybody else, so it doesn't matter. Why do you need to know that? This is a this is pointless. You know, why do you need to know at the age of 68 how good an athlete you would have been had you had your head out of your ass when you were 18? Those days are gone, Jack. Give it up, man. Get interested in, in asking other questions because it doesn't matter it's irrelevant when you're 68 how good an athlete you were when you were 18 or would have been when you were 18 because that's really what you're asking is irrelevant and there's no way to reconstruct it and if there was a way to reconstruct it what the hell are you going to do with that information tell everybody how good you might have been when you were in high school <laughs> when you were in when you were a thespian or a debater or in the band or what what the hell's the point you know, help me with that. If you can respond with a logical, clear answer to that question, I'll entertain this again. All right. All right. Now, okay. Jake Lutey asks, if during a deadlift I set the bar down a little forward of midfoot between reps, is it best to adjust my feet, pull the bar back over midfoot, or stand up and quickly repeat the five-step setup. Jake, if you're doing a set of five, you don't let go of the bar. Okay. So you don't you, you don't have the opportunity. You're not going to have the opportunity to repeat all five steps by letting go of the bar if it's really a set of five. All right, a set of five is when you don't let go. Now, let me point something out. Our friend Phil Meggers we just had a video about this the other day. Phil Meggers, starting strength coach up in Omaha, gave us a brilliant little tidbit to use for this that we're going to incorporate into the seminar's deadlift teaching progression starting this coming seminar. And it goes as follows. You're going to go through all the five steps on the first rep and lock the bar out at the top. Then you're going to look down and you're going to look at the middle of your foot and you're going to set the bar down over the middle of the foot, letting your eyes guide the bar back down into that position. If you do it like that, your knees will get out of the way and the bar will end up in the place it is supposed to be to start the next rep. Then you lift the chest, squeeze the belly down in between the thighs, setting the low back, and pull the next rep. Lock it out at the top. Look down. Place the bar back over the middle of the foot, guided by your eye gaze. If you do it like this, the bar will not roll forward, and it will not be necessary for you to replace the bar back to the middle of your foot, since that's accomplished on the way back down from the top. Try that and let us know how it works. Okay, Wichita fails, isn't that funny, <laughs> asks, Coach Rip, what is it, what is up, let me read this correctly now, Coach Rip, what is up with the plants in the front of the WFAC gym? They look like they are on their last legs. They look drier than a cup of your chili. Wow, <laughs> that's good. It is, it's stupid but it's Sick, it's inventive <laughs> all right my chili is you know like not dry uh how about some care for those guys you know for us vegans all right here's the situation which to fails that plant that banana plant in the front of the gym is older than you are all right got that given to me in 1990 29 years ago that is a 29 year old plant all right. When you're 29, ask God to bless you with the looks 
of that banana plant, okay? Because that banana plant's in damn good shape. It's been taken care of. And I'm sorry you're not, in, you know, now you know, okay? All right, now, Aaron asks, Hi, Rip. Love the new podcast. I'm a remedial massage therapist and I'm currently studying physiotherapy in Australia. Why do the UK countries, the Brit countries, call it physiotherapy instead of physical therapy? No idea. They all, it, it sounds more scientific, yeah. you know, and they, they get to say that they've gone to, gone to see the physio. Going to the physio Wednesday at 10. The physio says blah blah blah. Physios released me we have to, say to eat. We have to say PT. It's PT. Hard. It's hard. It's two words, yeah. and they just have a physio. It's the physio. Physio. It's like spelling program with two M's and an E. Color. Color. Yeah. Rumor. You know, it's like the fucking Canadians. Everything is a boot, one thing or another. They can learn from us. I mean, we I could. all their shit and made it better. Yep. Yep. We have improved upon just essentially everything. Their religion made it better. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Gotten rid of the Anglican Church yeah. and the Archbishop of Canterbury. And just now we just have, you know, the guy up front with the rattlesnake. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> we've improved on basically every goddamn thing. <clears throat> no, you're absolutely right. I don't know. I don't know. They're just a they're a strange bunch of people, the Brits. The windscreen instead of the windshield. Yeah. It's not a screen. Yeah. Screen's got holes in it. Right? right? Yeah, not if you're That's what keeps the mosquitoes out. Yeah. Right? The screen. Yeah. It's on the door. On the windows. But no, for them it's on the car. Right? I know there's all kind of strange things. Like the boot. That's a boot. But no, no. <laughs> <laughs> what is it in, in, in the Brit? That's the trunk of the car. Wait, wait, what? Oh, the boot is the, the boot's trunk. the trunk oh, okay. of the car, okay. right? The boot's the trunk of the car. And my favorite part about England is when you go in the bathroom in England and you look in the lavatory, the hot water faucet is over here on the left hand side, and the hot, the cold water faucet is over here on the right hand side, and never the two shall meet except in the basin. So if you want warm water, you know what you have to do. You got to run it into the. You got to run it into the basin because you scald, freeze, scald, freeze. If you, it's like, it's like running water is is still a odd concept to these damn people. You know, you know, I actually saw this. You're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you right now. All right, I, I walked into a bathroom in the UK one time, and I, you walk in, and there's one fixture in the middle of the lavatory. And on one side, there is a hot water. On the left-hand side, there's a hot water. And on the right-hand side, there's the cold water. So I thought, modern plumbing. You know, what have I stumbled into here? modern plumbing in the uk right and i turn the faucet on you know to adjust for for what would be warm water and i stick my hands under that and you know what happened there is a (laughs) (laughs) there's actually a divider in between the hot water and the warm water and the cold water so you've still you got one side of your hand is scald and the other side of your hand is 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 frozen over here. And it just That's excellent. Why did they What is wrong with you fucking people? How do you not understand about warm as a concept? It all goes back to the plague. They're scared the plague's going to come back. Do they do they drink water or do they drink beer only? They only drink alcohol in the uk you know the the alcohol in the uk there's you know i mean we don't you and i don't drink right they drink you they drink they drink help steph and i went over there last vacation we had was 07 we went over there to see some friends at scotland that's back when you could actually carry a pocket knife in the uk (laughs) you know to you know do things that you use a knife for besides knife crime right right and we went over there 
and these fucking people are are fabulous people they're just uh, we had a ball with them they're i've known uh known them for a long time and and uh we went over there and we we went out to eat with them a couple of nights and it's both nights is the same way we we cooked at the house well we went out first thing we did we went to the pub we had two beers and then we came back by the store and bought three or four bottles of wine took them back to the house and we we started cooking dinner had one bottle of wine the four of us middle of middle of dinner we opened the second bottle of wine then we had another beer and then we had the third bottle of wine with dinner and we finished that before dinner was over with and we're cooking supper you know and then we had the fourth bottle of wine so everybody in this four of us everybody's had a bottle of wine by now and then we got the malt whiskey out and i'm going you know i don't i don't really feel bad about myself anymore <laughs> you know, I, I think <laughs> I, I think maybe i drink too much but no no nah. this is like tuesday this is tuesday no sh- it is it was a mid it was it was tuesday and then they go play football after yeah <laughs> god almighty so yeah i mean there's some there's some wonderful things about the uk but the, but the plumbing is not one of them. all right so back to aaron's question about his physiotherapy all right uh, one of the books I own is the NSCA's Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. I'm sorry you bought that, Aaron. Overall, I found it to be an excellent comprehensive resource, especially the first 200 or so pages, which cover exercise physiology mechanisms that aren't discussed in depth in our A&P textbooks. Well, A&P is the, that's the sophomore level course and freshman level course. However, the remaining 400 pages, which are meant to cover practical, quote-unquote, strength and conditioning, are pretty much totally unhelpful. An afternoon reading tnation.com articles or practical programming would almost certainly provide more insight than what they are leaving students with in the NSCA course. I find this interesting because of how much high-quality scientific information is jammed into that textbook, first part of it one would hope that this knowledge produced competent coaches but as you discussed many times it mostly does not same rings true for both physiotherapy and remedial massage the education is of high quality and yet for every good therapist there's a quack peddling silly bullshit this is annoying because these people undermine the professions as a whole so question is how can the strength conditioning courses overcome this problem and give students better practical skills ones based on real results will these industries ever develop medical level standards given that so few studies on strength pain or injury are actually controlled and well designed oh there's so much material here aaron uh yes the uh the essentials of strength training and conditioning are not the essentials of strength training and conditioning. Practical programming is the strength, is the essentials of strength training and conditioning. Uh, uh, the text is all but useless, and yet it is uh, guaranteed to sell over and over and over again because the CSCS certification is uh, essentially. Uh, de rigueur for people graduating with a PE degree. Uh, it's just what you do. It's just what you do your senior year. You sit for the CSCS. And these people have done a marvelous job of indoctrinating uh, generation after generation of uh, graduates with PE degrees that they have to have a CSCS. Yeah, it's an exceptionally easy certification to get it's a multiple choice test i think there's a little video thing you have to pass uh no coaching proficiency is actually measured and uh i would say that the vast majority and i mean by vast i mean like way up over 90 percent of the people wandering around the street with the cscs have actually never done 
any significant amount of, of strength training under a bar. So much of what we do as professional barbell coaches is dependent on our own experience under the bar. It's, it's the stuff that we learn by doing it. And if you haven't learned by doing it, you cannot be expected to have the skills necessary to adequately teach and coach somebody else for these things. I mean, you can't coach what you haven't done. Now, you don't have to be the best in the world at it. In fact, it's detrimental to be real, real good at, at anything physical because people who are physical geniuses don't have to go through the process of learning things that those of us that just schlub through the, the process of trying to be as best, uh, the best that we can be. Uh, the stuff we learn in that process are, are things that we put in our toolbox and teach people that we coach. But if you haven't done it at all, then all of it is theory. And you're going to be wrong the majority of the time. So it is a mistake to seek out the services of a certified strength conditioning specialist because they don't know anything about strength. And uh, if you expect that that certification teaches you or prepares you to uh, teach somebody else how to do a, how to do a barbell squat, uh, a movement that you've never done yourself and you, you've never even thought about before, well, you're making a giant mistake. You don't know how to teach it. You don't know how to coach it. And you're not qualified to charge anybody money to show them how to do it. Uh, the... Uh, so the problem with, with most of this stuff is that unless you're doing these things yourself, you are not learning how to show other people how to do them too. All right. Uh, uh, being a professional barbell coach is an experience based thing. It involves experience like being a plumber, like being a piano tuner like being a surgeon it involves more than just theoretical concepts it involves a vast amount of experience learning how to solve movement problems under a heavy barbell it takes time and you cannot develop this ability as the result of being exposed to some information in school or uh being examined for that information you were exposed to in school by a weekend certification class with a multiple choice test and a video. Our starting strength coach examination actually looks at your ability to coach the barbell movements on the platform. And before you can advance to the examination part, you have to demonstrate to us that you can actually coach. And this is a, this is in stark difference do everything else in the industry and our people are better than everybody else's people for this reason uh, the education is uh, therefore a good place to start but an education in in this stuff is famously uh, is famous for being not very rigorous right? Uh, what we recommend in terms of education is a science background. We want you to have uh, basic science courses. We'd like for you to have general chemistry, even though we don't do chemistry in the weight room. You learn things about science and general chemistry. Laboratory general chemistry, the first freshman course in college for chemistry is perhaps the most useful thing you will ever do. You need to have freshman level physics. You need some biology. You really ought to have calculus. Not because you're going to use calculus, but because calculus teaches you to think logically. And if you can't think logically, you can't coach. Okay? Uh, more, more specialized information would be obtained in uh, 
anatomy and physiology, A and P, the freshman course, and general physiology, the junior level course. Uh, you you really need you really need that. Now, what's different about our recommendations as opposed to a PE degree is there aren't very many PE degrees that are actually science degrees. Uh, maybe your school's different, but I don't know of uh, a phys ed degree or a exercise physiology degree or a biomechanics degree that requires the students to have Calc 2 as a prerequisite for graduating. I don't know of one of those things. Calc 2 is not about calculus. Calc 2 is about thinking. And if the course is easy, then easy people are going to get through it. These are washout courses. They're there as a roadblock. They're sorting mechanisms. They're there for a purpose, for science degrees. And it's important to understand that part of your preparation to be an effective strength and conditioning coach may not involve strength and conditioning per se. In fact, most of the things that you are going to teach on the platform as a professional barbell coach are going to be learned by you under the bar, not from some goofball in your phys ed department, because chances are he's a badminton player, not a lifter. And what you're going to learn about lifting to teach your, teach your clients and your athletes is pretty much going to be what you learn out of the bar yourself. And this is, this is real important. Now, I'm not, you know, in a position to comment on physiotherapy and remedial massage. Uh, I, I don't have any opinion on remedial massage because that sounds like a, a, a thing that's in the U.K. countries. I don't know anything about it. Uh, but massage therapy is done in the United States usually as a, as a private school kind of a thing. They take you through a little course, and then you're just going to mash around on people. And, you know, it's not really what I would consider a profession, although you can approach it that way. Certainly the better ones do. Uh, physical therapy in the United States, I've commented on several times. There's an article on the website about physical therapy wherein I question whether or not it's fraud. Physical therapy is uh, woefully inadequate in terms of their preparation of PTs in the United States. It is, uh, it is missing completely the stress recovery adaptation analysis that we apply to strength and conditioning that should also be applied for the same reasons to physical therapy. Physical therapists in the United States go to schools that omit this as uh, part of the curriculum. And if that's omitted, then you, you don't understand how to get from here back to here, okay? Because that slope is common to returning somebody to function and to making a, an uninjured person stronger. The, the, pro, the principles are exactly the same. And if that principle isn't taught, then you don't know anything about what you're doing. That's all there is to it. And this is an interesting question, too. Will these in industries ever develop medical-level standards, given that so few studies on strength, pain, or injury are actually controlled and well-designed? Aaron, you've got some interesting preconceived notions about medicine. I'm real sorry to have to tell you this, but lots and lots and lots of doctors, lots and lots of doctors are really not much further along than LVNs on lots and lots of things. Sorry, Aaron. You know, what do you call the guy that graduated last in his class at medical school? You know. Uh I, you know, I, 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 the, the longer I do this, the more I'm involved in this business, and the more exposure I have to, to 
the medical specialties, the medical professions, the, the less impressed I am with the standards employed by most of these people. Uh, most doctors are trained, they're not educated. I'm not impressed with their analytical skills. Uh, you know, the average IQ of the average doctor is about 115, 120. He's like one standard deviation above average intelligence. Uh, they memorize things pretty well. They understand A equals B things kind of well. One from column A, one from column B, that kind of thing. You know, they can relate symptoms to diagnoses and diagnoses to treatment. You know, but that's not thinking. You can get an algorithm to do that. Maybe that's what it'll come to. And if it does come to that, it'll be their fault. Because that kind of an approach would not be markedly worse than what we've got right now and it'd be a hell of a lot cheaper a hell of a lot cheaper so uh stop worshiping the medical level standards okay uh get skeptical all right now anonymous asks why do you dislike powerlifting either even though 60 percent of your program consists of training the powerlifting movement well, Anonymous, uh, powerlifting, the sport, and the squat, bench press, and deadlift as exercises we use in general strength and conditioning are not the same thing. I don't know if it's occurred to you that when you squat, you're not necessarily doing powerlifting. Powerlifting is going to a meet seeing what you can get away with on the platform to, to score the biggest total you can, whatever the Federation's rules are. Uh, there's lots of things wrong with powerlifting. I am preparing an article on my thoughts on that right this minute, and it could very well be that by the time uh, this podcast is out, I may have that up on the website. And if you're interested in my thoughts on Powerlifting and what I think is wrong with it, it'll be in that article. Okay, now here's a, a, a question from Sheriff Iowa. Uh, every time I see a bizarre name like that, I want to spell it backwards. Let's see what I can do with this one. This one backwards would be a W L I E Ollie. Well, that didn't make any sense either. All right. Hi, Rip. I ask you to consider my modifications, which I can strongly defend. <laughs> All right. Now, Blair Goltra Sr. asks, can you suggest some auxiliary moves that would support and improve the overhead press? I'm 64 and been working the starting strength program for four years. have not been able to get beyond 105 for sets. All right, Blair, here's the, here's the deal with the press. All right, the press is one of these weird-ass deals that's kind of not like the deadlift. It's like the opposite of the deadlift. It's real hard to overtrain the press. It's real easy to overtrain the deadlift, but it's real hard to overtrain the press. And the reason for that has to do with the fact that the press is limited by smaller muscle groups uh, that, that lock the bar out at the top. And it's harder to tr overtrain small muscle groups than it is the whole system with a gigantic systemic stress like the deadlift applies. Back when the press was a contested lift, uh, pre-1972 Olympics, the uh, guys that were the best pressers pressed four days a week. And if you want your press to go up, you got to press more than the, the standard starting strength 
program calls for. Uh, and one of the most important ways to get your press up is to do partials. That's what the power rack is for. You set the barbell in the rack at various heights that allow you to lock out heavier weights than you can press overhead. And you work the movement from varying heights off of pins in the rack as another workout for the press during that week. If I was going to try to get my press back up, I would have to press four days a week. And that would probably involve a day where all I did was press. So in terms of auxiliary moves, the pin presses, and these are discussed in the blue book, or your friend, and it would surprise me if you couldn't get this thing up above 105 in two or three weeks just with the addition of, a, of an extra workout of pin presses in, uh, inside the rack. Give that a try. All right, Tim asks, I wear orthotics. The little things you, you put in your shoes to reinforce your arches. One foot has virtually no arch, and the other has very little arch. Should I wear the orthotics while lifting? Well, of course, Tim. You want flat feet while you, while you, while you lift weights? What happens with a collapsed arch? Do you understand what happens? Your feet collapse medially, right? And that would be pronation. All right, they collapse into pronation. Your foot should be supported so that your knees, the, the thing above your ankles, is in the correct anatomical position so that when you load the, the whole body, the hips, the knees, the ankles, and the spine are all loaded in correct normal anatomical position. So, yeah, you need your, your foot needs to be supported. When we finally get our starting strength shoes out, you're going to find a profound arch support in that shoe uh, that just will not allow you to stand incorrectly. That's the purpose of a weightlifting shoe. And the metatarsal strap on a correctly designed weightlifting shoe should reinforce the arch. So in the meantime, yes, wear your orthotics and get some decent lifting shoes that can support your foot. Because if your foot's not supported, your ankle's not supported, your knee's not supported, your hips aren't supported, everything's caving in. Uh, that would be varus. No, valgus, I'm sorry. I get valgus and varus mixed up. There's not enough difference in the words, I guess. Uh, so, let's go to Tom's question here. Hey, Rip, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Oh, that's so satisfying. <laughs> I like being agreed with. As to the supreme value of the big four, squat, bench, press, and deadlift, as the primary focus for general strength development. However, I'm curious about your thoughts on the loaded, weighted carries. There are too many varieties to mention, but I think specifically about the farmer's walk. They can be located, I think they can be loaded with a trap bar, or better yet, the farmer's walk handles that would allow for linear progression just like the big four. Lastly, what do you think about strongman training? The strongman training like atlas stones, yoke walks, axle bar, deadlifts, long bar, clean and press, sandbag carries, etc. have any value towards overall strength development? If so, then how do you recommend incorporating them into one's training? Or are they only useful or recommended for the actual strongman competitor. Strongman has been receiving a lot of attention recently on social media, especially YouTube, equipment more available, blah, blah. Okay, it has been my experience, and I have had experience with this, that strongman stuff can't be trained in the sense that we use the term, all right? If your deadlift goes from 400 to 700 like it needs to do if you are a big giant strongman competitor or strongman favors big men then what happens to your grip strength as a result of the deadlift going up 300 pounds 
it went up two. All right. So grip strength is in is incredibly important to carries. Now, one of the things about grip that's interesting is it's it's real easy to overtrain grip. As anybody that's tried to do a bunch of farmer's walks and do heavy deadlifts at the same time will tell you. So what I'm going to propose is that the deadlift trains the grip and that farmer's walks use the trained grip, but don't actually train it because farmer's walk is for time and distance and deadlift is for heavy load. A heavy set of five deadlifts trains the grip. Two minutes farmer's walk does not, but it fatigues the piss out of it and makes it harder to train. Uh, if you'll if you'll look at our material and the difference between training and practice, you'll understand me when I say that we train for strongman under the bar, and we practice for strongman with the strongman events and implements and this sort of thing. But that basic strength for strongman comes from barbell training. I think you'll find that your farmer's walk benefits more from your deadlift going up and your squat going up than it does from doing a bunch of farmer's walking. All right? It's, it's you know, should be obvious that all those great big strongman guys the real good ones, the guys whose names you know, are also big deadlifters. And for a guy with a 900 deadlift, a farmer's walk with 400-pound implements is much more manageable. 300-pound implements, certainly. So think in terms of training and practice as far as, as, far as strongman is concerned. I think you'll find that this analysis is very helpful. I don't think you can train strongman. I think you practice strongman. And it's important to do. You have to know all the little tricks involved in getting through to the end of a farmer's carry. Uh, you have to know how the yoke works. You have to know all this stuff in terms of the technical aspects of, the, of this particular expression of strength. But the strength is best built under the barbell. Those are my thoughts on it anyway. Of course, I'm sure you guys will all disagree with that because it's the Internet, right? Ben Roberts asks, could you explain why XFIS studies are illegitimate and why EMG data is unreliable? Well, XFIS studies are illegitimate because they are almost uniformly small population studies that ask the wrong question that rely on the equipment that happens to be laying around in the lab and that function primarily as a way to publish a master's thesis for graduate students. Uh, the classic that I like to refer to that, that is my all-time favorite illustration of what is wrong with all these studies is the famous study out of Australia back about 10 or 12 years ago that asked the important question, what is the difference in one RM bench press when performed on a bench and on a Swiss ball? Uh, that pretty much sums it up. That pretty much sums it up. How would a question like that get past the department chairman? Or the, or, or or you're just your instructor. How do you how do you come up with this bizarre idea that this is actually a question that needs to be answered, that can't already be answered with common sense? I mean, have you never benched anything heavy? Do you not understand that people bench well over five hundred pounds? How could that be done on an unstable ball? And, you know, the, the study, if I remember correctly, had 11 people in it. And, you know, while it just, this is, you need to look that up. It's, it's classic gibberish. And it got past not only 
the uh, the department chair got submitted for publication, got past the journal editor, got past the review people and was published and is now in the literature and the literature now says that there is no difference in one rm when you bench press on a bench or an unstable swiss ball there's no difference in one rm it just boggles the mind it's a stupid question that should never have been asked it was a stupid study the data set is all over the place. It's 11 people, N equal 11. What does it tell you? What, why was this published? What in the hell is the purpose of any of this? And you'll find that this is what's wrong with exercise science literature. It's as bad as the nutrition science literature. Nutrition science literature is bad because so much of it is self-reported. So much of the data is self-reported. What did you eat last week? Well, we know that you can't tell us what you ate last week. Hell, that's been studied enough to know that every single time you ask for self-reported diet information, you're going to get gibberish. It's the data. Is not, it's not even data. Yet, we draw conclusions. Uh, you know, and I've talked about this quite a bit, but but basically, it's, it, it has to do with why are we publishing this stuff? Well, because we got to get these kids through the program. And uh, they need a master's degree, and you need a publication credit. So by God, that's what we're going to do. Uh, it's the publishing incentives all across commercial science are all skewed. If you're interested in this... Uh, uh, get Charlton's book, uh, Not Even Trying is the name of it. Fascinating little little review of this topic. Uh, highly recommended. Uh, and uh, why EMG data is unreliable, that's easy. Find me the paper that shows the correlation between surface EMG activity and motor unit recruitment. And what you'll find is that there is no basis for saying that surface EMG indicates anything about motor unit recruitment. Yet that assumption is the basis of every study in which surface EMG uh, looks at motor unit recruitment. For instance, the famous position statement from one of the NSCA's publications where they draw the conclusion on the basis of 13 studies that the hamstrings are not used in the squat. Not making that up. Hamstrings aren't involved in the squat. Now, if you can draw that conclusion from the literature, then the literature is wrong. And the whole thing comes into into question the entire corpus of exercise science literature must be questioned because of the problems with literature and i'm not the first one to make this observation and i certainly as hell will not be the last one to make this observation but it's uh i mean until somebody has a better way of doing this uh clinical experience is far more important in terms of what we actually do as strength and conditioning coaches than anything out of the literature, which is of, of very, very little value. And last here, let's talk to Thomas Toilias. I sure I'm mispronouncing that, but if it's, you know, if it's from the internet it's probably somebody's made up bullshit name anyway like remember the guy that registered for the board several years ago who used the the name monkey vomit <laughs> you don't think that's his real name well i don't really care if it's <laughs> real i just deleted it because i talked to somebody you know 
like donkey pus. I'm not I'm not interested in having a conversation with somebody they who thinks that, that's what their parents named them. Parents <laughs> named them. Oh God. Hi. I am wondering why you why don't sumo wrestlers train with the starting strength method and why they don't drink Gomet. Well, because their coaches don't do that. You know, if it was up to me, they would, but it's not up to me. It's up to sumo to regulate how that thing is approached. Hell, the Japanese translation of the of the book's only been out six or eight months. Selling very well. Maybe we'll make some progress that way. But right now, they train in the traditional way of sumo, and they eat chanko nabe. And I've never had any of that, but I think it'd be real good. You look, what that recipe say it was in it? It's chicken broth and chicken uh, broth and whatever, usually fish and fish, fish and whatever else the the kids in the stable that are taking care of the senior guys in the stable are cooking that night. I guess they put potatoes and pasta and vegetables and you know fish and chicken and whatever else they got laying around, right? It sounds good to me. It really does. I like fish-based soup. You know, and if you put a bunch of chicken in it, God, it really sounds good. And they just eat a lot of that, and that's how they get big. And, uh, you know, sumo's another example of a big man sport, like strongman, rules of sumo uh, dictate that a bigger man is – harder to beat than a smaller man and that's just so the sports evolved to favor high body weight and these guys do that now uh, those of you that uh, are interested should look up and his uh, bouts are online Chiono Fuji 55 undefeated in a row I believe was his record He, sport. Yep, he'd be 58 about now. He's he's a little younger than me. What, he died? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. 2016. How about that? He was called the Wolf. He, he wrestled at a lighter body weight than most of everybody. He was 275, 285, somewhere in there. This man was strong and explosive and just a hell of an athlete. And... Uh, he didn't, won 31 tournament championships. 31 tournament championships. Uh, I believe his undefeated record was 55 in a row. And uh, the man was athletic and fast and quick. And uh, 53. 53 undefeated in a row. That's, I don't know, that's probably been broken since then. But at the time, this guy was, and he had big traps. He was, he was, uh, either genetically looked like a lifter or he actually trained with a bar. And he was impressive to all of us because of his overwhelming ability to, to, to outpower guys that were 200 pounds heavier than he was. And uh, what an amazing guy. And uh, he was uh, he was kind of a, a, a – had a different physique than most of those guys. He was – relatively low body fat but he was big and strong and fast had veins on his delts and stuff he was god damn this guy was impressive and uh chiona fuji look him up uh there's a little excursion into sumo there i haven't followed it recently it's just too many things to too other too many other things to do besides recreation so i have lost track of the sport and there may be an equivalent guy out there operating right now but uh he was uh he was fun to watch uh i would imagine that a lot of his old bouts are on youtube look him up how do you spell it so i can tell him C H I I Y O N O F U G I F U J I C H I Y O N O, Fuji, F U G I. <laughs> Fuji. So look him up. He does not 
need to be forgotten. He was a he was a great athlete and uh, a ambassador for strength around the world at the time. Well, that wraps it up. I'm tired of dealing with all this. You're tired of hearing me, so let's go do something else. And we'll see you next time on Starting Strength Radio. Thanks for joining us.